Welcome back, geologists, for the second half of Jurassic, where we'll be learning about the life forms of this time period. So we'll start in the marine realm and then move ourselves on to land and talk about some of the remarkable creatures that lived during this time. So cephalopods are going to radiate in a huge way during the Jurassic and the Cretaceous periods. Belemnites are non-coiling cephalopods, and they reached up to five and six feet long. They look like big giant bullets, but they had a squid hanging out, much like you see at the end of this one right here. But imagine that on a five to six foot scale, uh, swimming as a predator through the ocean. So the largest of these guys lived at this time during the Jurassic period, and specifically, once the Zuni had started transgressing during the middle and late Jurassic periods. Coccolithospores are microscopic creatures that lived in the ocean. They make a calcareous phytoplankton shell, very microscopic, but they first evolved in the Jurassic. They become very, uh, very widespread during the Cretaceous period. But this is what they look like. And I want to point out when we're talking about microorganisms, they're very useful in biostratigraphy because when we find their presence, some of these are very limited to very restricted rock layers, so they make excellent types of index fossils. But nevertheless, these guys first appeared during the Jurassic period and were very primary producers of Mesozoic oceans. Plesiosaurs are very famous as marine reptiles from the Jurassic. Well, they existed pretty much throughout the Mesozoic. They're going to kind of outcompete the ichthyosaurs, but this is a famous group of organisms, probably more so than the ones that we'll talk about in the Cretaceous period about mosasaurs. And plesiosaurs have two ver versions of body types. One is the one that you see right here, which is one of my models of a long neck plesiosaur and then the short neck version that they had. Regardless of where they live, the short neck guy has probably lived at the bottom and fed on fish and other types of creatures like ammonites and, and uh, other types of cephalopods, maybe ichthyosaurs, likely ichthyosaurs and sharks, and, and maybe smaller plesiosaurs. But we know that the long neck ones probably swam uh, and much acted like some of their counterparts of aquatic or semi-aquatic type of organisms that were reptiles. So these guys were fierce predators of their time and uh, you know some people think they're still alive with Loch Ness. Well I've been to Loch Ness, Scotland and I can tell you there is something in the water but it's pretty imp implausible to say it's one of these guys. You know it was foggy who knows if the noise we heard was real? I mean, it could have been imagined, but I remember going, and I was just a teenager at the time, and the big deal is, will you see the Loch Ness Monster? Well, is it a plesiosaur or not? I, I don't know. I would say no, because we know that marine reptiles went extinct, all except sea turtles, and I might add that the turtles made the, the jump into the Cenozoic, and we still have them today. When you look at a short neck version of these guys, one characteristic of plesiosaurs is the paddles that they have on their, their sides. Well, mosasaurs kind of did too, but they have a, a basic different body plan altogether. And these are reptilian. They are not mammals. And I need to group that together that you'll understand the ichthyosaurs that started in the Triassic are still with us even during the Jurassic. And Plesiosaurs radiate and become a big deal during the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, and then Mosasaurs dominate during the Cretaceous period. Flying reptiles are going to diversify dramatically during the Jurassic period. Pteranodons are going to show up during the Jurassic period as a major diversification of pterosaurs, and here's one of those at the American Museum of Natural History. They had a distinctive type of shape of head, but they're simply a type of pterosaur. And flying reptiles are only going to get more diverse and more widespread through the remainder of the Mesozoic era. Archaeopteryx is a, an important fossil of the Jurassic period because it represents the evolution of birds. And 
the thought is evolution from theropod birds. Now, if you recall back to our discussion in Triassic about the proto-avis, uh, there are some discrepancy, or should I wouldn't even say discrepancy, turmoil would be the right uh, term right now in the paleontology world as to where is the start of the first bird. We just don't have enough data on proto-avis right now to call it the first bird, but we certainly do for Archaeopteryx. So if you're watching this in five years, it would have been changed anyway by then, but if you were to say you have it, it could be different based on fossil evidence that we have. And that's the beauty of paleontology is it changes as discoveries are made. So a couple of characteristics that makes this bird important is it shares both reptilian and aves types of characteristics. One of the most important bird characteristics that it has is feathers. And in addition, it has a fused clavicle. So that's very, very important. But it has a number of reptilian characteristics, such as the sharp teeth, the S-like neck, which was very characteristic of theropods. It had a long tail, which birds don't today. Um, it had clawed wings. So it had a number of features that transitioned between both types of animals, but it clearly was a bird. And the first one was discovered in 1860, and most of the fossils have been found in a, a central location site in Germany. So it's a big step to develop our first bird because right now all we have are flying reptiles and insects. So we're going to join the club with the evolution of Archaeopteryx. Massospondylus is one of the dinosaurs that we'll be learning about for the Jurassic period. Before I go on much about him, let's talk about some of the dinosaurs in general of the Jurassic and kind of get through the myth of Hollywood. I'm all for movies and especially the Jurassic Park series and Jurassic World. And one of the reasons is, is because it puts that childhood dream of finding dinosaur bones back into people. And a number of some of our great paleontologists are actually in the field doing work because of the inspiration that some of these movies gave them. You need to realize, though, that when we're talking about paleontology, we really have to base it on evidence and scientific evidence that's provable, testable, and reproducible. So some of the animals that you saw in these movies and other types of similar dinosaur movies may or may not be accurate. <laughs> There's no easy way to share that message. And people have made assumptions based on a number of papers or descriptions, even internet descriptions about animals. I have no problem with what they're doing at all because, again, it, it sparks the interest of people wanting to learn more about these animals. But I caution you to research and find out from good scientific strong literature that supports the evidence and research done on individual species to really get your information. So a couple of things that I'm going to be doing in the, each of these periods as we talk about dinosaurs is tell you what their name means, a little bit about them. I am not so worried about size. I mean, I could put something that's ludicrous in size for an animal that should stand out for you on a test, but really it's about is it Sorician or Nathician? What kind of dinosaur was it? What kind of class was it within that dinosaur type? When did it live? And the when did it live part is extremely important. In the case of this guy, he lived in the early Jurassic period. Most of the dinosaurs that we'll learn about actually lived in the latter part of each period, making it pretty easy to learn. So this guy was about 16 feet long, three feet tall at the hips, and eight gastroliths. And looking at this, I can look at his hip joint right away and see his Sorician dinosaur. And that means he is in the sauropod department, but he's a sauropod. He is like a pro sauropod, which means he was kind of like one of those transitional guys. He's kind of a little controversy because some people feel that he walked on two legs, but the early pro sauropods showed evidence of that and the ability to walk on four. So this is definitely a sauropod. That means he was an herbivore dinosaur. A patasaurus previously known as Brontosaurus, is properly classified and termed as a patasaurus. So make sure you call him by his right name. His name means deceptive lizard. 
This guy is a giant sauropod, got up to about 20 tons, 75 feet long. Can you imagine <laughs> walking around with that? Ate a lot of plants. And I'll kind of go back to what I said in the first lecture part of Jurassic about these enormous sauropods. Imagine the amount of waste byproduct that they're going to produce. So usually we don't talk about dung beetles because fossil record is not that great for them. But I mean, you have to realize that these animals were in huge concentrations back then in order to deal with the byproduct of these incredibly huge herbivores. So I know from eating a lot of green stuff that it produces also a lot of gas. And I mean, you may laugh at this, but I can't even imagine what the potential air quality would have been like around these guys uh, when they were eating so much vegetation. So it's kind of funny to think about, but this is certainly a reality of some of the fun stuff as we piece together the history of these organisms. Diplodocus is one of the longest dinosaurs ever found. He gets up to usually about 90 feet long, with the longest specimen getting over 100 feet long. Again, it's a late Jurassic dinosaur. And all sauropods are herbivores, so he was an herbivore. These long necks and long tails like this, if they're built like that, that means they were pretty much uh, living in more of a horizontal manner. And uh, so they ate food that was closer to the ground instead of something with a really long vertical neck, more like brachiosaurus. So these guys weighed between 11 and over 17 tons. That's just incredible. They were huge and basically would dominate in herds and could survive that way. Now they'd get born in the forest and then until they got big enough that they couldn't live in the forest, those little guys would have to hopefully find a mother herd that they could hang out with and have that protection from some of the more elderly Diplodocus before they got to a large enough size that they could defend themselves. So their tails had two rows of bones in order to support this extra weight and also give them a more ability for mobility. So that's important in their journeys. And most sauropods had to keep like three feet on the ground at all times. They were so huge in walking and uh, just to maintain an, an upright position with their body weight. They had five toes on their broad feet and they're going to definitely need kind of a sprawl foot in order to sustain that weight. And they had a large claw that is large compared to other sauropods on their toes and their name means double beamed for those two rows of bones. Camarasaurus is a unique species of late Jurassic sauropods. I got this replica at Dinosaur National Monument. They had it for sale in the gift shop and I was really taken by it because it's just so awesome looking and it looks just like what they have in, on the display from what they found there. This guy got up to about 50 feet long and weighed up to 51 tons. So it's another huge uh, sauropod. So it's a late Jurassic sauropod, ate coarser plant material, and you can kind of see that by the teeth. When you look at these animals' teeth, they're designed for whatever food resource that they were consuming at the time. His name means chambered lizard. Brachiosaurus is one of the most famous of all of the giant sauropods because of his giraffe-like neck. So a couple of things to consider about this guy. How do you keep blood flow going to the brain way up there? So it's kind of thought that these guys probably had a pretty high blood pressure. These guys got up to 131 feet long, <clears throat> 131 feet long and up to 56 feet tall. So these were huge guys, over 60 tons in some cases. Wow, I mean, just the thought of these guys they would have maintained a big body temperature, and that seems odd when you think about these big dinosaurs, but most of their mass is confined to the actual middle part of their body, and the rest of it is in tail and neck. So um, some people think that these were warm-blooded animals, or at least had the ability to control their body heat simply because of their uh, compacted size in the middle. <clears throat> 
they had very small heads in comparison to their long necks, and they utilized these long necks to reach a special ecological niche of leaf matter in the tops of the trees. His name means arm lizard for an obvious reason because of his neck acting as an arm to reach that food resource that he had. These are remarkable creatures. They traveled in herds, and they... Uh, I just can't imagine being able to see one in person. If you ever got to go back to the Jurassic, it would be pretty spectacular. So I can remember in the first Jurassic movie when they see a brachiosaur for the first time, the paleontologist, and it brings them basically to tears because it is such a phenomenal sight to be able to witness these life forms that were so huge back in the Jurassic period. And mind you, the late Jurassic. So climate change with the shift of where the continents had moved and the oceanic currents had changed us to a warm, equitable type climate that produced extensive vegetation for these animals to feed on. Compsognathus is a theropod. A couple of clues that it's a theropod and not a sauropod would be this. He's on two feet, has arms that are shorter, his forearms with hands. He's got a long S neck and a long tail, a big eye socket, lots of sharp serrated teeth. This guy got up to about five feet long at, at biggest capacity and up to about 10 inches tall. He's tiny. He's the size of a turkey. So one of the reasons I wanted to share this guy with you as most everyone has this image of the late Jurassic as all being giant dinosaurs. It's just not the case. Even in the presence of Brachiosaur, we had tiny little theropods like this guy running around eating a variety of different types of organisms like small insects, potentially maybe small mammals. Uh, he probably ate lizards, other types of maybe even tiny dinosaurs that existed at that time. But he's running around in the forest floors, doing his thing, looking for his niche, and found a really good way to survive. His name means pretty jaw. Very interesting little dinosaur. And you look at their specimens, they're just, it's, they're tiny. And it's just unique to look at in comparison to some of these bigger dinosaurs that we're learning about. Ornithalestes is featured in a number of dinosaur movies. If you've seen the series Walking with Dinosaurs, he's featured in those films. This guy was definitely a theropod, so he was a, a carnivore. Got up to about six and a half feet long and weighed up to maximum about 25 pounds. What's famous about him is he has a little crest on his nose. And that's a unique feature that not all of these types of theropods had. Like other theropods, this was a swift, agile, fast runner, and his name means bird robber. Torvosaurus was a much larger theropod in comparison to Ornithalestes. This guy got up to a max of about 36 feet long and weighed up to about 3.5 tons at max. Now, what's interesting about Torvosaurus is that he had thicker teeth than most theropods. I find that an interesting uh, evolutionary development. Why a different type of thickness of teeth? Well, that suggests something interesting. He might have had a stronger bite force than other theropods at size, but his jaw isn't the same size as something like an Allosaurus. His name means savage lizard. I guess I should also point out that Paleontologists believe that many of these carnivores also could have been scavengers. So you need to realize that they just weren't necessarily out for a fun kill every single day. They were there for survival. And the predators are significantly outnumbered by consumers. So there should be less of them in the fossil record than we would see of consumer types. The apex predator of the late Jurassic is the Allosaurus. And this is a T-Rex type like animal, very common fossil found in the Morrison Formation that we discussed in part one of the Jurassic period. They got up to max of 43 feet long, 16 feet tall, and about one and a half tons. What's really incredible about these guys, they had developed vertebrae that were concave on both sides and contained shallow cavities allowing them to have an hourglass shape. This hourglass shape made them have a little bit lighter weight which gave them some mobility benefits. His name means different lizard and Allosaurus is by far the most common predator found in the Morrison Formation. 
Scylodosaurus is an Ornithischian dinosaur that got up to about 13 feet long and up to about 550 pounds. What's neat about this guy is he's an armored dinosaur, so like an Ankylosaurus, but uh, from a different time period. He was an early Jurassic dinosaur from the Ornithischian lineage, and he had leaf-shaped teeth, so he ate shrubby-type plants, kind of a neat little guy. Very armored, so basically these guys, are if they get attacked, one of the benefits is they sit low to the ground and the predator has to be able to turn them over with a chance to kill them in most cases. This guy's name means limb lizard. Othniella is named after a famous paleontologist who discovered some very important fossils. So this is a Ornithischian dinosaur that was an ornithopod. So ornithopods are bipedal. These guys got up to about four feet long and one foot tall at the hip, so they're very tiny ornithopods, about 50 pounds. So they kind of amuse me because most ornithopods are huge. They had a very horny beak, a little tiny skull, and lots and lots of cheek teeth. So that's very common in all ornithopods. These cheek teeth are designed to grind food. They had armor plates on their back, which is indicative of most of the dinosaurs that we see from this time frame. And his name means after Othnell Marsh, which is the actual paleontologist that was an American that named a, a series of species. So that's where this guy got his name. So Stegosaurus is the next dinosaur to discuss in the late Jurassic, and no Jurassic conversation would be complete without a look at this marvelous creature. This was an Ornithischian dinosaur in the Stegosauria lineage. These guys got up to about 21 feet long and up to four and a half tons in size. They're built a very unique way. They have these amazing plates up and down their back and they're actually osteoderms, they're, they're bone material, and then they've got this tail that has a thagomizer at the end of it, which is these two rows of spikes that come off and it's thought that they use that as a defense mechanism. So the double row of plates on their back, there's a lot of thoughts for what this was would have been for, for mating uh, purposes, for temperature control, for scaring predators. So lots of research is being done to try to determine how stegosaurs use those plates. After I processed one in a lab, I was so amazed with the detail that this animal had in their plates. They're obviously cavities for blood vessels to go into them, which would lead me to believe that they could flush blood into those uh, systems. Now we know that they ate on very low grazing vegetation, and I can tell you after extracting and helping to cast up a skull of a stegosaur and actually seeing some skulls of stegosaurs that have been dug up, I was taken back by the size of the head. It was not as big as I was expecting it to be. And so that was kind of a surprise, but as big as the rest of the bones were for the animal. So when you see a stegosaurus, you know, the plates are what give it away, and the thagomizer, which is the cool thing at the end of the tail, here's a, the head kind of showing you how tiny it is. But nevertheless, these were very important Ornithischian dinosaurs for the late Jurassic. So we Look at the Jurassic plant life, and I have to tell you how critical this plant life is because without uh, all the different varieties of plants that we would have from tropical to mountain type things, from ginkgos to true cycads that we had, conifers, lots of ferns, and lots of ferns, and lots of ferns, we would have had all the right food for these incredibly huge dinosaurs to grow to their maximum size. And so something's gonna to happen to the large sauropods at the end of the Jurassic period as climate changes as Zuni C begins to regress off the craton for a while and it goes through the early Cretaceous and then it re-floods the continent back by the late Cretaceous. So understand that the plant life and the dinosaur life are correlated together. They have to be. There's no way these dinosaurs would have been able to get to their massive size without the aid of the food resources to do it and the plants give them that tool. So I can only imagine what the lush 
jungles and forest of the Jurassic must have looked like and would love to see it if I ever got the chance. Were there mass extinctions? No, but we know we lost some very important animals. The large sauropods go away at the end of the Jurassic period. Now there's still a handful of genera left for the Cretaceous, but the big ones that we know, they're gone. Things like Allosaurus and some of our other predators pretty much aren't there for much longer. So we didn't have a mass extinction, but we had a targeted area of certain groups of dinosaurs that didn't make it through. So what are some Jurassic highlights? Remember Pangaea I was in stage two of its erupting. The Atlantic Ocean Basin is fully open because Africa and South America had finally separated in addition to North America, South America and Africa that happened in the Triassic. The early Jurassic was marked by the Arb Soroka regressing off, which led to the development of really Aeolian conditions in Western North America, which deposited the famous Navajo sandstone. And it would be an instrumental process in forming the Gulf of Mexico Luan salt domes that we learned about. We also learned about a late Jurassic formation called the Morrison Formation, famous for dinosaur bones. Also on the, on the animal life, corals, Sclerotinian corals, to be exact, replaced the rugosa and the tabulate corals that went extinct during the Permian. Mollusks significantly radiated with the non-coiling cephalopods getting to their peak during the Jurassic period. In terms of looking at dinosaurs, the largest sauropods to ever walk the planet existed in the late Jurassic with a handful of predators that were important with the apex predator being the Allosaurus. We didn't have a mass extinction, but we lost the big guys like Diplodocus, Brachiosaurus, Apatosaurus, and so forth at the end of the Jurassic period. So I'm so much looking forward to sharing with you the finale of the Mesozoic period the next time we visit for the Cretaceous period. See you then. Bye.